Hello and welcome everyone to our first ever and hopefully last fully remote Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration at Bates. I am Clayton Spencer, president of the college. I want to extend a warm welcome to our students who are joining us from all over the country and the world, faculty, staff, alumni, and parents, as well as the many guests who are taking part this year, relieved of the usual concerns about chapel capacity, wintry main roads, or competing schedules. Wherever you are, whatever brings you to join in today's virtual community, welcome. We are so glad that you are with us today. Like so much in this year of challenge and adaptation, this remote version of our annual MLK Day celebration required numerous adjustments and creative thinking by our planning committee. I want to thank the entire committee for your very hard work over many months. And in particular, I want to thank this year's co-chairs, Michael Sargent, Associate Professor of Psychology, and Andrew Baker, Assistant Professor of History. I also want to thank those of you who are leading or taking part in the impressive array of workshops, podcasts, panel discussions, art exhibitions, musical and dramatic performances, and the annual debate, of course, with Bates and Morehouse students that will build out our MLK Day celebration with opportunities for learning, reflection, challenge, and celebration. We are particularly fortunate to welcome as today's keynote speaker, the activist, scholar, and author, Dr. Angela Davis whose work and life bear witness to the issues at the center of national and international struggles for equity and justice that have defined our nation's history for four centuries and resurfaced with renewed exigency this past year. Our theme for this year's MLK Day as set by the planning committee is confronting our history, justice for coming times. With its explicit reference to the Bates mission statement, this rubric invites us to consider our institutional narrative, the story we tell ourselves about ourselves and reflect on where it might fail to account for the gap between our commitments as educators and the experiences of our students during their four years on campus and later as they move forward with their lives. Benjamin Mays, who graduated from Bates in 1920, and went on to become one of the leading American educators of the 20th century, as well as mentor to Martin Luther King Jr., described the purposes of education as follows. Generally speaking, he said, education is designed to train the mind to think clearly, logically, and constructively, to train the heart to feel understandingly and sympathetically the aspirations, the sufferings, and the injustices of mankind, and to strengthen the will to act in the interest of the common good. Likewise, our speaker today, Dr. Angela Davis, stresses the inherent connection between education and action. Significant social transformation is always, she says, grounded in education. And the overarching purpose of knowledge is indeed to make a crucial difference in our social world. Education is, according to Davis, an indispensable form of activism because it drives us to ask questions. Even more simply, we have to talk about liberating minds as well as liberating society. Any institution is in and of its time and place at once a generator of culture and a reflection of it, both actor and acted upon. Today's program in all of its forms urges us to reflect consciously and intentionally on what we owe our students and what we owe the world. It invites us to consider our confounded past as a college and as a nation, our manifestly imperfect present and our urgent future. It demands that we connect the personal liberation required for our students' growth and realization as individuals with the collective imperative that we use knowledge for the public good. And 
as Davis has said so powerfully, it challenges us to do the work of educating ourselves and our students to fight for equity and justice, even when this work is out of the spotlight and progress is slow, so that we are prepared to seize the moment like the one we find ourselves in now, when more people are listening and prepared to take action. Again, welcome all, and please make the most of this day's offerings. I would now like to turn the virtual podium over to Bates Seniors, Perla Figuerera and Lobanos Mengistu, co-presidents of the Bates College Student Government. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome all faculty and staff, students, and members of the Bates community to this very special keynote session in celebration of MLK Day. Before we begin, I hope you're all having an amazing break and are finding times of relaxation and stillness, even during the times we find ourselves in. My name is Perla Figuereo, and I am from the Boogie Down Bronx, New York, but I'm originally from the Dominican Republic, where I'm speaking to you today. And I am currently a senior, double majoring in rhetoric, film and screen studies, and theater. Hi everyone, my name is Lobanos and I'm from Somerville, Massachusetts and originally from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. At Bates, I'm a senior double majoring in politics and Africana studies. Perla and I both serve as co-presidents of the Bates College student government and it is with great honor and gratitude that we speak to you all today. MLK Day, both on and off campus, has always been a very important day for Perla and I, but this year it's extremely, it's extremely special. COVID-19 has allowed us to examine the glaring inequalities that exist in America today. In addition, we saw some of the largest Black Lives Matter demonstrations in cities across the globe after the horrific death of George Floyd at the hands of police brutality. Perla and I, along with many Americans, find this day to be very special because it celebrates the life and achievements of Dr. Martin Luther King, who worked to end racial segregation and institute racial equity and, and a challenge we still face today. However, on and off campus, the fight to end white supremacy continues. When thinking about the theme for our speech today, we decided to center on the question, what does activism mean to you? This is a question and topic that is very present for Lobanos and I, um, as we find ourselves in the crossroads of many issues in this world. We're both immigrants, black, young, and in academia. We are young adults who in less than five months will be graduating from a predominantly white institution. Equity, justice, and persistence are words that consume us, that we always have to think about because most spaces that we are in were not created for us. When I think about activism, I think of stirring the pot. I think of a pot, uh, of a pot as calm, unbothered, content with what it is. And I think of myself and my push for change as a spoon that disrupts the calmness. Activism to me is fighting for what you believe in, standing tall and proud, advocating for what you are fighting for and not stopping until change is achieved. In the midst of significant racial tensions in America today, it is important to remember in the words of Dolores Huerta, every moment is an organizing opportunity, every person a potential activist, every minute a chance to change the world. As black students at Bates, Perla and I, along with BCSG, Bates' Black community, our peers and allies, have tried to continue to stand up to the systems of oppression that exist on our campus. Given the events that unfolded at Bates a week before the election, we are continuing our push for all student demands to be met, hoping to create a Bates that is more equitable when we leave than when we arrived. Activism by Black and Brown people advocating for a more equitable society is always met with resistance. Not only is it met with resistance, but it is highly interrogated and challenged. It is telling someone that Black lives matter and then telling you that all lives matter. It is explaining to someone that a uniform can be taken off, but your skin color is permanent. Activism for the Black female body is always being the choice for someone else to make because my words are not important. Lastly, activism for the Black and Brown people is saying fuck that and speaking up for what you know is important to your people. It is Lobanos and I running for student body president at a white institution and working for our, all our students and acknowledging that our BIPOC, queer, disabled, and international students are our most vulnerable communities on, on campus and that it is our job to have their voice heard. In a world that seems so dark and in America where black and brown bodies are still devalued, exploited, and abused in a future that seems so unpredictable, we must continue to fight for what we believe in 
We must dismantle systems of oppression. We must call out racism when we see it. We must hold those who are responsible for the marginalization of black and brown bodies accountable. The best way to fight racism is to stand in solidarity against white supremacy. I hope that you find inspiration in our words and the words of everyone else who will speak to you today. May you find hope in them as you face whatever challenges life will throw at you. Thank you. I want to leave you all with one last thought, an MLK quote. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. My Bates community, let's keep on screaming. Welcome and thank you for being here for Bates College's 2021 Martin Luther King Junior Day program. Our theme this year is confronting our history, justice for coming times. This evening, we have the opportunity to come together and engage Dr. Angela Davis, who will be in conversation with Dr. Tree Pickens. Dr. Davis's keynote is entitled Reckoning, which sounds amazing. And there will be a Q&A opportunity for participants at the end. We are recording this to be replayed during the MLK 2021 program later this month. Please make sure that your notifications on phones and computers are turned off so that we are not distracted nor distracting. I'm privileged to share this introduction space with Joshua Red, who is a senior here at Bates College and the president of the Black Student Union. Um, Joshua. It is definitely an honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Angela Davis. Dr. Davis has embarked on a teaching career that has taken her around the country. San Francisco, Vassar, Stanford. Dr. Angela Davis, currently a distinguished professor um, emer emeritus of History of Consciousness has been hailed one of the most influential people of 2020 by Time Magazine. In the year prior, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Dr. Davis has inspired decades of scholarship and insightful, relevant discourse for this generation and generations to come. In her text, our, our, in her text, our Prisons Obsolete, Davis begs the question of the necessity and the eventual phasing out of prisons and subsequently policing. Dr. Davis explicates the technologies of the prison that strip Black people, especially Black women, of bodily autonomy and respect. This text also flirts with the implications of settler colonialism and anti-Blackness, a topic that I would later embark on for my year-long research progress. As a founding member of Critical Resistance, an organization dedicated to dismantling the prison industrial com complex, Angela Davis demonstrates a clear dedication to human and civil rights. And in freedom is a constant struggle, Angela Davis connects the struggles of Black people in America and in the diaspora to the struggles of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Her internationalist politics and praxis, evidenced by years of galvanizing activism and organizing, is evident by her reception of the Fred Shuttlesworth Human Rights Award from Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. In her article, Reflections on the Black Woman's Role in the Community of Slaves, she highlights the labors of Black women that are often ignored from historical reflection, even though their labor is essential to any informed understanding of American history. Dr. Davis has had an, undeniab an undeniably impactful role in shaping how we understand the role of Black women under the hegemony of a world governed by racial capitalism. In Davis's work, the Black woman is a requirement. The Black women, their liberation, their aspirations and their labor are essential to all analyses. Through her work, through her written works and her lectures around the world, she has shown us that justice, unity and liberation are not only demands, but necessities. She has inspired many to speak up against what Kianga Yama, Yama, Yamahada Taylor called intertwined malignancies of capitalism, racism, sexism, ableism and other oppressions that render us vulnerable in a world structured by policing. She reminds us that freedom is a constant struggle and that a win does not mean that the struggle is over. Instead, a win is one win of many. Thank you, Josh. Um, so I feel particularly privileged today to have the opportunity to introduce an inspirational colleague who generously contributes to conversations and work around critical engagements of race, gender ability, the body, inclusive pedagogy, and critical race theories in her teaching, scholarship, and mentoring. I am honored to have Dr. Tree Pickens as a member of my beloved community. Dr. Pickens is the Chair of Africana Studies and a full professor in English here at Bates College. Dr. Pickens' most recent book has won an honorable mention for the Modern Language Association's William S. Scarborough Prize. 
She is also a Pushcart Prize nominated poet. Dr. Pickens has just published her second monograph, Black Madness, Mad Blackness, which explores the connection between blackness and madness. She aims to architect a series of conversations that retool our theory and praxis for and about the black mad and the mad black. In her first book, New Body Politics, narrating Arab and black identity in the contemporary United States, she asks, how does a story about embodied experience transform from mere antidote to social and political critique? Dr. Pickens ushered in a new set of conversations about blackness and disability, when as a guest editor for the 50th anniversary issue of African American Review. Dr. Pickens has published an edited collection called Arab American Aesthetics, Literature, Material, Culture, Film, and Theater, as well as having generated profound contributions to the growing areas of public scholarship in Miss Magazine, The Root, Medium, and countless guest expert experiences on multimedia sources. So thank you, Dr. Davis and Dr. Pickens. Um, we will turn this over to you now. Thank you so much for being with us. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Davis, for, um, for gracing us with your presence again. You were here uh, really almost 30 years to the day. Do you remember coming here in 1991? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. It was around the time of the Gulf uh, War. Yeah, and you you led people in a um, uh, it, well first you eclipsed your your speech and and gave an extemporaneous um, talk that spoke to the nature of the times um, and then afterwards there was a unplanned protest through the streets of Lewiston uh, which some faculty members who uh, were here at that time remember having experienced and others through lore. Um, one thing you may not know, actually, uh, is that not two days later, the faculty voted on Friday, uh, January 18th, to no longer have classes for the MLK Day celebrations. And I think it was due very much in part to, to your consciousness raising, because one of the things you said in the last 16 minutes of your speech was, uh, there are certainly things happening outside, but you also need to take care of your own home your own living room, your own backyard. Um, and so there, uh, I think, was a pressure on people, students and, uh, and faculty alike, um, to really answer that call. And so that's one of the ways that they did it. So we, we owe you a debt of gratitude for what this day has become. So thank you. Absolutely. And, and thank you for helping me remember <laughs> uh, that uh, important time 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was lovely to get a chance to see your um, your speech, and I'm certain that that folks will uh, make access to that on the other multimedia platforms. But what was also striking to me was that there were so many ways that your speech then resonates now, um, because in 1991 you hadn't yet written "Our Prisons Obsolete," um, but still you were talking about the imbrications of the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex, how folks who were fighting in Vietnam um, gave the parameters for the SWAT team that you saw implemented against Black mm -hmm. Panther offices in LA. And so I know that that takes us uh, through some decades. And so I'm curious if you can um, talk a little bit about uh, how our prisons obsolete resonates today. Well, the call for prison abolition is almost as old as the institution itself. Uh, and um, when I wrote Pris Our Prisons Obsolete, it was um, in the aftermath of a mobilization uh, that was developed by critical resistance. Uh, we called upon people throughout the country and other parts of the world who were doing work around prisons issue, prison issues to come together uh, under the theme of acknowledging uh, the prison industrial complex and moving beyond it. Uh, so that the uh, title of the conference was Critical Resistance uh, because we re recognize that it was crucial to resist it was absolutely 
essential to resist, but at the same time, our resistance needed to incorporate our awareness, our critical awareness um, of uh, social, economic, po political developments in the world. Um, and um, so that book is um, pretty much, I think, um, that book attests to a collective, the emergence of a collective recognition that um, at a time when increasing numbers of people, especially black people, indigenous people, people of color were being um, sent to prison, that we needed to attempt to organize a movement that would allow people to begin to think differently about the role of this institution in our society. Um, we, we wanted to disarticulate crime and punishment mm -hmm. because um, at that time it was assumed that punishment is simply in a causal relationship with crime. You do the crime, do the time, right? And what we wanted to do was to demonstrate that the ways in which the um, prison population was expanding so rapidly had to do with other processes. It had to do with global capitalism. It had to do with racism. Uh, and so that book, I think, um, was an attempt to lay out a new um, terrain for, th for thinking about the a part played by punishment in the um, reproduction of racism um, and capitalism. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I loved about the book, I mean, many things I loved about the book, but one of the things that I really appreciated was that you embark on that disartic disarticulation work um, and question the very notion of time, that the idea of doing time is an extraction of the social wealth that people can accumulate in the way they add to their communities. And so I'm curious about how you view that happening now. Well, um, yeah, and, 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 and there were aspects of the analysis that didn't quite make it into the book because the book was de designed to be um, um, a, a kind of um, you know popular analysis, uh, uh, but the very fact that time um, is at the core of punishment uh, uh, reflects the role that time plays in constituting uh, the value of the commodity. Uh, so uh, that in in a lot of ways there. Um, uh, imprisonment as punishment is only possible in the context of uh, what you might call a capitalist democracy. Uh, imprisonment in the sense that it uh, deprives uh, uh, the person of um, rights and liberties that have to be acknowledged uh, in order to be divested. Uh, so. Um, it is not possible to imagine imprisonment as punishment in the context of a society that does not accord rights and liberties uh, to a people. And, 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 and at the same time, um, we, um, we were um, um, attempting to um, point out that uh, the prison is the most dramatic example of structural racism. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to uh, recognize that these conversations about institutional racism, systemic racism, structural racism uh, have a very long history and that the prison has been at the center of that history. Yeah, I mean, you also talk about the way that it's a, an instrument of misogyny and misogyny against black women um, a little bit more specifically because of the way that the rights you're talking about that are divested were never afforded to women generally and certainly not to black women. And so the way that white supremacy manifests itself in the prison is also through the vector of misogyny and ableism for these, these groups of people who were never afforded these rights. So it's so much easier to take them away as well. Yeah, and there are other aspects of um 
I would say, a feminist analysis uh, that allow us to uh, 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 recognize the connection between um, punishment as enacted by um, carceral institutions and punishment that happens within domestic contexts. So I actually, um, I can't remember exactly whether this made it into uh, the, the book or not, but uh, <laughs> I think it's 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 really important to uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, the uh, the relatively small percentage of of women behind bars does not necessarily reflect proclivities uh, toward criminal action right. uh, in the way that it has been uh, represented, but rather. Uh, the uh, the fact that there were other ways of punishing women uh, uh, that uh, were uh, very much a part of um, of daily routines uh, uh, and and so we also think about domestic violence yeah. as having a connection with state violence uh, and and and. And, and in, in many ways, I, I, I wrote an article long ago uh, called, um, oh my God, if I can remember the title, um, it was something, <laughs> something about uh, uh, public, um, public uh, punishment and private something. So it, it, it was an attempt to um, look at the, the ways in which domestic violence has been have been, has been represented uh, outside of its connection to um, um, institutional violence or state violence, and and it, the, the, there's almost a way in which you can say that um, that the um, um, domestic abuse of women results from a kind of um, 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 relationship that allows men to um, enact that violence on women within private settings mm -hmm. uh, that happens on a much larger scale with respect to men in the public setting, as to say, in, in inside prisons uh, in relation to the police. But we know also that women um, have always been imprisoned. Uh, um, uh, but but have also suffered uh, other forms of violence, uh, and and this is why it's it's sometimes more um, um, interesting and 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 more um, enlightening to look very specifically at the impact of the prison system on women because we are become aware of these relationalities that. Um, that exist with respect to men and others in prison, but become clearer when we look at the way in which um, um, gender um, structures the prison industrial complex. Yeah, it, you know, what occurs to me right now is that we saw that up close when COVID uh, required lockdowns. Uh, that there was an increase, an uptick in domestic violence, but also a decrease in the way that people understood it and we're reporting it and it coincided with the uh, building up of the movement for black lives uh, around the murder, uh, the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Um, and uh, one of the comments made actually about the defund the police uh, movement among many uh, was by um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who said, you know, people are always talking about city budgets for uh, certain for certain things and money that you need for counseling, for, um, for jobs, for homelessness, et cetera. And the defunding the police was finding the line item. And so it brings it it's back full circle to your ideas about disarticulation. Do you see the movement for black lives as an outgrowth of the consistent advocacy for prison abolition or part of it? How are you, um, how are you viewing those together? Well, I think it's very clear that uh, the the movement for for Black Lives um, um, exists on a continuum, on a historical continuum, in yeah. relation to the movements that came before. And uh, of course, you know, I can think about the 
the period when I first learned about uh, abolition, uh, prison abolition as a possibility. And that was in, in the late 1960s, um, um, the early 70s, when I myself was in jail, when the Attica Rebellion happened. Uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, really important uh, insights uh, that I think um, uh, uh, should be um, uh, emphasized in these conversations about um, um, the development of public consciousness around prisons and the police and the call for um, the abolition of the police, defund the police, the call for abolition of prisons, is that many of these ideas came from people in prison. Um, yeah. And, and we often don't um, pay enough attention to the intellectual production of people who are behind bars. Uh, but so many of these ideas that we are working with today can be traced not uh, back to an academic uh, who uh, presents them, uh, uh, but rather to uh, people who were um, theorizing their own lived experiences. Uh, um, and, and so, um, yeah, I think that um, it's, I mean, it's amazing that, that so much, so many decades have unfolded as I, as I think about the way in which this consciousness has developed and finally uh, has become more or less mainstream. Um, uh, but at the same time, it, 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 it lets us know that persistence uh, in doing this work, even when it appears as if no one is listening, even when it appears as if nothing is changing, um, uh, can indeed bring about change. I should say that in the early 1970s, uh, there was a very palpable sense that prisons were on their way out. Uh, uh, many uh, people in the mainstream, if one looks, you know, for example, at the articles in the New York Times uh, that were published around that time, you see people thinking very seriously about what it might mean to get rid of prisons and to develop other ways of addressing the issues that prisons purport to address but cannot address. I mean, as a disability studies scholar, I know that co coincided with a, um, a movement to take away the institution of the mental hospital because it was also a form of incarceration. Um, what's, what's really interesting to me about that is that the opposition seems to have won out, right? Um, and as you said, there's consistently been a conversation about prison abolition. And so I'm curious if we could turn to the opposition for a moment. Uh, former President Barack Obama quipped that the defund the police was a catchy slogan. You've already made the point that it's um, it's a long-standing history of advocacy. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm concerned, actually, as someone who's really uh, for prison abolition, that someone with his clout right, is not actually tapping into the great uh, great amount of history and uh, activism and advocacy that's been done. So. Um, this is perhaps a leading question, but what do you think he and others who think that way are missing? Well, yeah, I, I, I was pretty disturbed when I read that uh, as well. Uh, 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 you know, although I know that, uh, that, that Obama uh, represents himself as a moderate uh, politically mm -hmm. and, and has pretty much always done that. Uh, 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 you know, maybe things were different when he was a community activist, uh, uh, but um, um, yeah, um, I think that that was a, a, a statement that was not well thought out because even if he wanted to disassociate himself uh, with those of us who are more radical, uh, he could have done it differently. Um, um, and, 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 and I think that intelligent people recognize that uh, when we say defund the police, it's not simply about withdrawing funds for the police and not 
anything to address the issues that the police might be in, 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 in this particular moment called upon to address. It's about shifting funds. As a matter of fact, I can remember many, many years ago when the University of California had this um, horrendous um, budget crisis from which uh, we have not really uh, <laughs> right. So this was a, uh, and and uh, I can remember at that time uh, looking at the figures uh, uh, that uh, captured the funding of the university as opposed to the funding of the prison system, and saying at that time, if more uh, University of California faculty and and students and workers had been involved in the um, campaign to abolish prisons, right. that, uh, the funds would have been available uh, you know, for uh, um, uh, the, um, well, you know, for all that is required to run a university for faculty salaries, for uh, fellowships and scholarships, uh, et cetera. Um, so yeah, um, I, I think that, um, that we should ask uh, uh, Obama to think a little bit more deeply and with more complexity uh, uh, and not simply to assume that uh, uh, by disassociating himself with one slogan, uh, uh, he's done um, the work uh, that needs to be done at this moment. Well, yeah, I mean, I nothing to say to that, but absolutely. <laughs> Um, and as someone who went to UCLA, it always baffles my mind that the land grant institutions aren't actually given enough uh, that they need to, to run on, um, which, which sort of brings me to, I think, a question about the role of the professor. So you, you made it very clear, and I, I completely agree with you, that um, the calls for prison abolition have not come from academics. Uh, most of us are cosseted, very safe in our positions. Uh, many of us tend to be uh, conservative. I'm not one of those, but there are some people who are. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to what you think of is the role of the professor. I mean, my own pedagogy uh, sort of, uh, I don't wanna say errors because it's not an error, but I go on the, the way of thinking of myself as a steward of information. Um, do you see professors as stewards? Do you see us as doing something different or something even a little bit more than that? And in your own, how does that, how's that shaken out in your own praxis? Well, first of all, I think I would make a distinction between information and knowledge. Okay. Um, because information now is so widely available. All we have to do is, you know, pick up a, a cell phone and we can, there is information uh, uh, available to us. But on the other hand, the relationship to that information is what we need to be concerned about. Uh, and as uh, I've always um, thought about teaching as uh, helping students to acquire um, a, a way of um, creating um, relationships with the world that are critical, that um, are based on critique, both positive critique and negative critique. So, so so I see my role as a teacher as, as helping students to generate questions, uh, how to ask questions uh, about all the information that is available to us, but questions about our lives, questions about uh, the conditions uh, 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 in which we live. Uh, and of course, one doesn't have to go to a university to acquire that uh, uh, facility. And as I was saying before, uh, so many intellectuals behind bars have raised questions that academics never came up with. Uh, uh, and, and, and oftentimes academics take credit for the work that has been done uh, uh, by people in prison, by, um, by um, um, movements, uh, 
uh, you know, I think about the, the field of, of, of black feminism and how that emerges from a convergence of, uh, of, 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 of organizing and activists uh, uh, with um, those who do um, intellectual work professionally. Uh, right. And, and, and it's not always the case that those who do this work professionally are better at it. Uh, uh, so that <laughs> part of teaching, I think, is to teach students that knowledge gets produced in so many ways and so many places. Uh, and that because we happen to have been um, uh, exposed to professionalized modes of producing knowledge does not mean that we are the best uh, and does not mean that we cannot also learn from those who have not had the capacity or the ability to uh, engage in these uh, professionalized processes. So I think that that the role of the um, of, 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 of the teacher is really to um, encourage people to think deeply and think critically and raise questions even about those aspects of our lives that we most take for granted. Hmm. Your pedagogy sounds a lot like um, our colleague here, Sue Houchins' pedagogy. To oh, I love Sue Houchins. Yeah, <laughs> we all do. <laughs> um, to encourage people to, to think about uh, where they are, who they are, how they got there, um, and to um, to really rest uh, w r e s t with the critical um, with the critical armatures that we've been handed down. It does remind me of something you said in your um, in your time here in ninety one, where you pointed out that being part of a um, predominantly white institution means that people are learning things, becoming acculturated to things and ways of being that don't suit them, that don't acknowledge their cultures, that don't take for granted the knowledge is produced there. Um, is, uh, I certainly still <laughs> believe that's the case. Has that borne out for you over the past 30 years in some ways you'd be willing to, to share? Has it worn out? Well, uh, borne out for, for you, have you seen it at work? Oh, um, <clears throat> so, um, I guess uh, to continue the the previous conversation about teaching um, and, and 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 learning, um, uh, um, I I'm also careful to recognize the power of contradiction. Yeah, and that uh, in 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 in. In the approach to knowledge that uh, that most of us have had um, access to, contradictions uh, are to be resolved. Uh, one um, is urged to figure out which is the right way, uh, and so one um, uh, chooses one side or the other. Mm. But what if we hold both intention? And, 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 and see, as Audre Lorde said, uh, you know, what gets creatively generated by, by, by the, the tension of, of, of this contradiction. So um, in that context, I would say that, um, that universities are so important. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and for those of us who are people of color who find ourselves at uh, predominantly white universities, uh, uh, yeah, it's important to embrace that. And at the same time, to be uh, thoroughly critical, uh, to um, recognize uh, that uh, the, the, the institutions that we inhabit are products of slavery and help to reproduce racism, and all of them all of the negative work that they do to acknowledge that, but at the same time to recognize that this is the, 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 the venue where we are, are able to uh, develop the capacity to make critical interventions, uh, to do work against racism. Uh, 
it's it's often difficult to encourage people to um, um, hold those um, um, polar opposites uh, in tension and to embrace to embrace the contradiction there rather than to assume that what I have to do is to leave this venue and find some other place that uh, is going to be um, 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 more relevant or, or better suited. Uh, uh, my, my position is that wherever we are, we create arenas of struggle, no matter, you know, we might be at the center of, 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 of a major capitalist corporation. Yeah. Uh, and we can still do that work. I mean, look at the look at what workers do in places like Amazon. Uh, uh, and so, why not uh, those uh, uh, who are also um, uh, considered to be in the leadership? Why can't they also join the workers in demanding better conditions? And um, so, wherever we are, right. we stand up and we fight. <laughs> yeah. Um, it seems to me that that's really at the crux of a radical politic that can't be realized necessarily in the voting booth. Um, and I think that's something that you pointed out elsewhere. Can you expand on kind of what that means as a radical politic or at the crux of a radical politic? Yeah, no, you're right. It is. It, it, it is precisely uh, that uh, capacity to uh, think uh, with more complexity about uh, the potential of, of, of such sites. And, you know, I've many, pointed out many times that, um, that the, uh, the electoral arena is not uh, by itself going to bring about change. Uh, uh, and, you know, one we, we were talking about Obama. Uh, it was amazing that he was elected uh, and it was a world historical um, change. Uh, um, but then people didn't continue to make demands. And, 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 you know, there were those who assume that because a black man was elected, uh, that all we had to do was um, sit back and let him uh, uh, move the world forward. And of course, uh, we see what happened. Uh, we should have been out in the streets demonstrating uh, from the moment of his inauguration, uh, uh, and then uh, we, things might have turned out turned out differently. Uh, but I think it's important now to recognize that in the the sense that we've finally um, we finally uh, witnessed one important victory against looming fascism. Uh, yeah. But it does not mean that uh, we step back. It does not mean that uh, uh, we don't continue to demonstrate and make demands that uh, Biden and Harris uh, will be compelled to seriously examine. Yeah, I mean, that sounds both like a, um, a reflection on the past, but also a warning for the future that black faces in state politics does not indicate radical politics at the level of the state. Is that an accurate assessment of what you said? Well, it is, and, 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 and not just uh, with respect to um, bringing you know, more Black people into uh, the um, institutions of the state, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a comment on the failure of the strategy of diversity uh, uh, writ large, uh, and we see how quickly all the in, all the major institutions of our society embrace this notion of diversity, from corporations to universities, uh, and and diversity without uh, transformation, mm -hmm. uh, without without a, a movement toward justice simply replicates the conditions that were responsible uh, for the racism and the misogyny and, 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 and the exploitation of workers in the first place. Uh, um, and I, um, 
you know, I think voting is so important. I'm so impressed with the work that people like Stacey Abrams have done. And this is just so incredible. And, and as Black people, we know that one of the major struggles that helped to develop uh, the 20th century uh, movement for Black liberation was the struggle for the right to vote. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have to take that seriously. But at the same time, uh, it's important to uh, recognize that uh, the um, the ideas that uh, will push us in a more radical direction that will help us to move toward an end to racism, uh, that will, will help us uh, imagine a world in which uh, there is uh, not the kind of uh, economic exploitation uh, that, uh, that we see now in the concentration of wealth into the hands uh, increasingly of fewer and fewer people, uh, uh, that, um, that, 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 we will, that we will have to see um, the world of radical politics as unfolding you know, in our organizing, in our mobilizations, in our demonstrations, in our uh, efforts to uh, engage intellectually uh, with uh, uh, ways of imagining the future. Yeah, I mean, to that end, I think you um, will probably be really proud of our students who recently protested to ask Bates to reckon with the tensions that it has in its history um, both being um, championing its founding by Anabaptists, but also really recognizing that it sits on stolen land and as well benefited from um, the slave trade. And so the students are fomenting uh, this energy around changes in the curriculum that would be beneficial for all of us and that don't do lip service to diversity. Um, and I, I think this is the moment where I'm supposed to ask uh, one of the current Black feminist questions around self-care um, and what it means to have a praxis of self-care. Um, this question is particularly of interest to me as someone who uh, lives as a disabled and chronically ill woman, um, but is also um, an activist and a scholar, et cetera. Um, because so often we're told self-care is so important, um, but uh, what is a day uh, that's stress-free for a Black woman look like in America, right? I'm not sure that day is, uh, is anything more than a Cinderella fantasy. So <laughs> I'm curious about how you're um, thinking about these conversations regarding self-care um, and what it means to have a practice for that or what it means to engage in that in these current, these current times. You know, that's a really complicated question. Um, uh, and and I, I, I welcome the attention on self-care that has uh, been uh, produced by the work of young activists. Uh, um, you know, those of us who are older um, uh, um, remember the, the, the moments when uh, we were encouraged to deal with whatever problems that we might have that were un, seemingly unrelated to the struggle to deal with those problems outside of the context of, 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 of the movement. Uh, and with Black Lives Matter, uh, we, and with the uh, insights from the, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the movement around uh, disability. And I, I think this, we're just now beginning to recognize how important that movement has been for giving us uh, frameworks and ways of thinking about uh, abolishing incarceration. Uh, uh, um, so I think that self-care um, Self-care can be imagined as a, an individual phenomenon, as an indiv even as an individualistic uh, practice. Uh, and I think I kind of engaged in um, that individual self-care uh, out of necessity uh, uh, um, from the time I was in jail myself, uh, mm -hmm. when I, 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 I couldn't, 
uh, figure out how to deal with the stress and the anxiety and you know all of those issues. Uh, uh, and someone gave me a, a, a book about yoga. And so I began this practice of yoga from a book when I was in jail. Uh, and then later, um, because my friend Erica Huggins, who had spent time in, in jail herself, uh, and who was at that time much uh, um, more involved in practices of medica meditation and, 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 and yoga, I, I remember when she was trying to teach Huey Newton how to meditate. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a sight. <laughs> you know, I, I like to imagine what his life might have been yeah. had, he, had he had that practice. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think now um, the, the challenge is to incorporate this into our work as activists, into our work as organizers, into our work as uh, intellectuals who are trying to uh, um, create new ways of, of, of thinking about, uh, about the world. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that answer. I think it's, um, it's inviting us to do both the critical work of self-reflection and reflection about our work uh, together, um, as well as think about how we can be of service um, to uh, the movements for equity and for justice worldwide. Um, my part in this uh, wonderful evening let me, is- Let me just yeah. say one thing before uh, our conversation ends. I had earlier today, I had this wonderful Zoom call with a group of um, children, um, 11, 12 years old, uh, who, are, um, who are called the alphabet rockers. And they, um, they, they have um, uh, recorded hip hop albums uh, and, and their focus is on getting rid of youth prisons. Uh, they've mm -hmm. done a lot of work against uh, uh, children in immigrant detention. Uh, they create um, uh, butterfly or origami and and so I was saying to them, you know, you're doing the work the way it should be done. You're producing joy and pleasure at the same time as you're teaching people how to change the world. And I think that we, we, we often separate the, the work that we do as activists from you know, what is pleasurable to us. Uh, 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 the, I, I, I'm thinking about Adrian Marie. Um, uh, Brown's uh, pleasure activism. Yeah. So I think that we're just beginning to acknowledge the, the centrality of collective self-care and joy and pleasure to our ways of demanding a new future. Yeah, thank you for that. That's such a beautiful image of children helping to do, to do that work. Thank you. Um, and it's a, it's a lovely note for us to move into the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Noel Chaddock. And thank you so much for sitting down with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pickens. Uh, what a fabulous conversation. Um, so thank you for uh, giving us some time um, on top of that amazing uh, perspective, Dr. Davis. Uh, we'll move into the Q&A. Um, we have participants in the wings. Um, and so two participants, uh, the way that we would like to do this is if you would please put your question in the chat, you can either send it to me privately in the chat if you don't want your name associated with it uh, for some reason or to everyone in the chat. And then if you would like to ask the question yourself, please I'll raise your hand. Um, the raise hand function is at the bottom of your screen. If you could see um, where chat is uh, to the left of that, uh, if you press on participants um, at the bottom of that drop down menu, you should see raise hand option. Um, and some of you might find your hand raise option has uh, migrated to the reactions button, which is to the right. Um, and it's a smiley face with a plus. 
Um, so I will uh, start looking for raised hands um, and for questions in the chat. Um, and if it's okay, Dr. Davis, I will uh, call on folks as they come up um, and read a few questions as well. Okay, so while folks are uh, getting ready, um, let's start with uh, Claudio Jimenez. Um, and um, I've asked you to unmute your microphone, uh, Claudio, and uh, go ahead when you are ready. Oh, hi. Hi, Dr. Davis. It's a pleasure meeting you. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, how have your notions of race and gender evolved throughout the years? Oh, that's a very complicated question. Um, and um, I don't even know whether there's enough time left in, in the program for me to um, discuss that issue. I, but, but, but I think that our, our understandings of uh, race and gender have evolved in relation to the work that we have done. Uh, you know, I grew up as a, as a child uh, in, in the most segregated city in uh, this country, knowing that it was important to stand up against racism. Uh, and I've done this all my life. Uh, uh, but it wasn't until later that I recognized um, that, uh, um, that racism was connected uh, are, are deeply connected to um, sexism and to, I, I think I may have uh, originally grasped the relationship between racism and um, capitalist uh, exploitation, uh, but it took me a while to grasp the relationship with uh, gender. And I, I've said many times that um, black women were the ones who were in the forefront of the movement against racism. And, we were in the front lines. Um, many people aren't even aware of the fact that the majority of the members of the Black Panther Party were women. Uh, but our ways of conceptualizing racism were masculineness. Uh, and we thought that uh, freedom for Black people uh, would be synonymous with freedom for the Black man. You know, I'm reading, I'm reading um, Frederick Blight's um, auto. Frederick Blight's uh, biography of Frederick Douglass. Uh, I'm sorry, um, what is his first name? David Blight's uh, biography of, of Frederick Douglass. And, and, uh, and it's very insightful in uh, beginning to um, uh, disentangle the uh, patriarchal notions that define the ways in which we were urged to imagine black liberation. Uh, and and this, this is not to, to uh, uh, I mean, of course it is to be critical of someone like Frederick Douglass and, we're, and it's to be critical of someone like myself for um, you know, not recognizing that sooner. But at the same time, we recognize that the work we do helps to deepen and render more complex our ways of thinking about the world, including race and gender. Uh, Thank you so much for the question and for an amazing answer. Um, we have someone who would like to ask. Um, so referring to the demands for justice from black activists in June of this year, uh, you Dr. Davis said that we were in a very exciting moment and you said that you hadn't seen such a major global challenge to racism and colorism before and that you were encouraged by what might be possible in the future. So the question is, have the developments that have followed since that June moment then left you satisfied or disappointed? And do you still hold the belief um, that this moment is coming? Well, I would say that um, we are still in um, that moment of, of, of addressing the conjuncture that was symbolized by the response to uh, the killings 
of, of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, um, we often uh, think that uh, radical change gets represented uh, uh, by mobilizations. And of course, mobilizations are important. It was extremely important to witness the fact that, that huge numbers of people, uh, more people than ever before in the history of this country, more white people went out uh, uh, under conditions defined by the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, and demanded uh, that we take move in a different direction, that we begin to recognize the ways in which we are still living with that history uh, and, and that we are now starting to do work that should have been done 150 years ago. Uh, so the point that I'm making is that um, we're in the phase now of actually doing the material work that can institutionalize change. Uh, and that the results of that will not become evident immediately. Uh, uh, we can only hope and we can only encourage uh, universities, uh, colleges and universities like Bates to begin to look at their histories and begin um, to um, recognize the ways in which they have contributed to uh, the um, structural racism that uh, we learn uh, during this period uh, is so much more important than the expression of um, the individual's expression of racist ideas. Uh, of course, uh, racist attitudes are bad and they need to be abolished, but they're never going to change uh, the society. And we're, in, we're at a point now where uh, we can begin to do that, um, that work of, of, of bringing about change within organizations, uh, within institutions. Uh, I, um, I work with the uh, SF Jazz, San Francisco Jazz. I'm a, I'm a member of the board of directors and we're in the process now of trying to think about how um, this institution, which of course is is, 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 is a product of music that has been produced by black people, um, but at the same time has been controlled uh, by white people and the majority of the audiences are, are white. How can we change this? Uh, so I think that every institution now has to, to, to initiate that process that will continue in the future. Uh, it's not, you know, next year, we won't be able to say yes, so we won. This is a, this is a, um, a, a process that is going to uh, continue over uh, uh, the years. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you drawing our attention to the continuum um, and the cyclic nature of the work um, and reminding us that it is something we cannot put down. I would like to invite Imani uh, Bogan to uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Professor Davis. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, you mentioned earlier that intelligent people are aware that when we call for defunding the police, we more mean a shifting in funds. I'm wondering, since some consider social services and education, particularly in our urban communities as an extension of the carceral state, and in keeping in mind that we must be critical of where those funds go um, towards the outcome of change that we actually require, where do you think that we should shift these funds? Well, um, of course, this is a complicated process. Uh, and, you know, first of all, we need more funds in education. And that's, that's, that's an issue that has been plaguing us. Why is it that education is a commodity? Higher education is a commodity that is only available to those who can figure out, you know, how to either pay or get a scholarship. Uh, uh, Education should be free. Um, what about healthcare? Uh, we're 
we're witnessing now in this pandemic, the impact of a um, privatized healthcare system that has been so commodified that if one does not have the means with which to pay, uh, one um, dies. It's, it's, and, 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 and of course, um, uh, those, the, those are some of the larger uh, institutions that need to be funded. Um, but then there are also questions of, uh, of what the police actually do. Uh, the police are engaged by and large in activities that do not require armed human beings. And so why is it that if a person is say in a mental health crisis, uh, that the, the, the only thing uh, people are asked to do is to call 911, which is going to uh, result in the dispatching of armed human beings and more than likely a very um, negative outcome. Uh, so why can we not reimagine what we need in order to be secure? Um, you know, what is the meaning of, of security, health and security? And how do we uh, rethink our um, public um, uh, formations in such a way that will allow us to uh, build um, new institutions uh, and that do not rely on the police and on the ways on, on and on other institutions, as you pointed out, social services that um, have been so affected by um, carceral approaches. Mm, thank you so much. I really appreciate that phraseology, uh, carceral approaches. Um, thank you, Imani. An another question, um, and there were several questions, um, so I'm kind of um, putting them all together um, around your time with the Communist Party. Um, and this question says, I'm wondering if Dr. Davis could speak to her current relationship with the U.S. Communist Party, given her previous role as a vice presidential Communist Party nominee, and your relationship to the two-party system as we know it today. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I was reading the rest of that question. I think, um, I think I'll stop the question there. Uh, but there were several folks who were interested in this um, and wondering if there's a, a place towards Black liberation and racial equality. Um, and is the Communist Party playing a role in that? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think I, I was looking uh, at the question in the chat. I think I found it. Uh, um, and the person says that they are unaware of my current membership status in the Communist Party of the United States. I'm, I'm no longer a member uh, of the Communist Party. I haven't been since the early 90s. Uh, but, I, but I do uh, have, have um, connections and, and relationships with people who are uh, members of the Communist Party. I, I, um, when I left the Communist Party, it was not because I uh, was discarding socialism or communism. Um, it was because of a particular set of circumstances um, that within the, the party that um, uh, prevented the dem democratization of, 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 the, of, of the institution itself. Uh, and, and I, I, I said then, and I continue to say, I still consider myself a communist with a small C. Uh, uh, and I still do uh, events for the Communist Party. I um, engage in uh, conversations uh, uh, with them. And I, and I do not believe that we can ultimately move beyond racism as long as we uh, uh, remain within this system of, 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 of capitalism, of global capitalism, of racial capitalism. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, during this period, it is so important to uh, introduce uh, a, a critique of capitalism into our conversations about racism. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, at a time when 
wealth is increasingly concentrated in ever smaller uh, um, uh, numbers of, of, of people and ever larger uh, portions of the population uh, are left without the capacity to sustain themselves. This is precisely the reason why the prison industrial complex developed as it did to, uh, to uh, address, uh, not address, but to take advantage of the fact that increasing numbers of people no longer have the capacity to sustain themselves. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, proliferation of prisons uh, happened precisely at a moment when uh, education became less available, healthcare became privatized. Uh, it, it became that dumping ground for those who were rendered superfluous uh, by the economic uh, uh, developments in the world. And let me say, I've been talking about um, uh, the prison system in the U.S. Uh, uh, and I, I, I should have much earlier on pointed out that this is a global phenomenon. This is not confined to the U.S. Racism is not confined to the U.S. Uh, uh, what we are witnessing are the consequences of colonialism and slavery uh, throughout the world, of uh, all over the, the planet. Uh, and so, um, yeah, um, I still, you know, very much uh, 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 believe in the importance of developing critiques of capitalism and looking towards systems of socialism, uh, communism uh, that will assist us in uh, moving toward the future. Thank you so much. Um, Darwin, um, do you have a question? Yes. Hi, uh, Ms. Davis. I just want to say thank you so, so, so much for being here today. Um, I personally really appreciate it. I'm sure we all do. Um, so hearing you speak, I had a lot of thoughts coming into my mind. So if this question seems a bit confusing, just work with me and I'll explain a little better. Um, but I was thinking about just mostly just the, the older generations um, involved in the activism during the 1950s and things of that nature. Um, and the younger generations and the discrepancies between the perceived efforts in towards uh, more systemic equality for Black people. Um, and I guess just my question is like, what are some of the things that you feel both generations should learn from each other um, in terms of the efforts to fight towards equality, especially with the whole aspect of, of educational resources and the lack thereof in low socioeconomic neighborhoods? Uh, and, you know, I, I asked this question because I, com I conducted a, a thesis that I was looking at a lot of research regarding um, self-handicapping, which is just the act of um, perceiving that you're not equipped academically to succeed. So you kind of set yourself up for failure and it's, it's frequency amongst Black students. And um, although these educational opportunities are available to them, there's still this sense of not feeling uh, belonging to the classroom and they don't perceive an importance of their education due to like stereotype threats. So yeah, like what do you think the older generation and younger generations can do? Um, or what do you think is something they can learn from each other in order to combat this stuff? Well, you know- Throw I'll, a lot at you. Yeah, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for, for uh, raising that question uh, because I do think that multi-generationality is um, so important uh, in the work that we're doing. Uh, the world is multi-generational. Um, it doesn't exist without the very young, the very old, and all of the um, and, and all of the generations uh, 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 in between. Um, you know, I was just thinking um, not not very long ago. I was uh, invited by um, a, an old friend of mine. She was my attorney, Margaret Burnham, uh, uh, who teaches. She she's a, a law professor at uh, Northeastern now. And she runs a, a, a program that's called um, uh, Civil Rights and Restorative Justice. And so she invited me to speak at uh, her conference. Uh, and, and, and then I said, well, her mother and father 
were members of the Communist Party, uh, you know, Black communists, uh, who in the 1940s, uh, the, uh, the late 1930s, the 1940s, uh, uh, did work in the South that actually created the um, ground for the civil rights movement. It was with an organization that was called the Southern um, Negro Youth Congress. My mother joined that organization and was, a, was an officer. Um, and uh, this was actually my first um, connection with communism goes back to when I was, I was a very small child. Um, but I, 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 when I spoke at this conference, I, I spoke about the work that Margaret's father did against uh, racism uh, in, uh, in, in, in the 1950s and specifically around um, Emmett Till. Uh, uh, and she does work now uh, that attempts to uh, recognize the damage that was done uh, during that period in the 30s and 40s to people who were lynched and who had their land taken away from them. Uh, um, and, um, and then after that, <laughs> After I did that conference, interestingly enough, I went down um, and, and did a Zoom yoga class uh, with uh, Margaret's sister and her 106 year old mother was also on the call. Uh, and, and so I'm saying this because um, uh, we often forget that uh, we're all connected and we're, we, we, we we teach each other, we help each other. Uh, there is as much to learn uh, that, that older people can learn from younger people as younger people can learn from older people. We often have this very mechanical idea that the role of the elders is to dispense wisdom and knowledge. And, and then you know, the young people are the ones who uh, go forward and make the change. And to a certain extent, that's true. Uh, but I think that, uh, that uh, we have to keep in mind that this uh, multi-generational approach uh, uh, helps us to incorporate a historical consciousness into the work that we do. Uh, and I think um, that is more important than, than anything else, a consciousness of, 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 of the, um, the, the, the historical continuum on which we all uh, are situated as we try to you know, push the planet in a progressive direction. Thank you so much for that. And being in community with our students and faculty and staff and alumni, having really uh, grown to appreciate that multi-generational um, ethos and effort. Um, are you okay with one last question? Oh yeah, sure, of course. Wonderful. This is from one of our students. Um, and she would like to know with everything going on around us, how do black people find peace in it all when basically everything feels like it is against us? Um, well, I think we find peace in the knowledge that we are a part of a process that has been unfolding uh, for uh, generations and, 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 and centuries. Uh, um, and I, you know, I, I was talking earlier on in the conversation about um, self-care and finding pleasure in the work that we do. Uh, and as I grow older, I realize that that is perhaps the most important aspect of the work that we do. Uh, it's not only challenging racism, but learning how not simply to survive, but to flourish in the context of addressing these huge, huge issues. Uh, uh, and, and if one looks at the, the history of the Black liberation struggle in this part of the world. Uh, the meaning of that history is, is not, I think, to be sought only in the ways in which 
Black people figured out how to confront uh, uh, these uh, horrendous examples of, of, of violence, of state violence, uh, uh, of, of, of the violence of slavery, but how in the process of developing ways to fight back and stand up, Black people have also created beauty uh, and, 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 and culture, cultural um, uh, approaches that allow us to um, simultaneously stand up and fight and at the same time um, in, uh, enjoy ourselves, at the same time receive joy and pleasure. I mean, music has been at the very center of the, div of, of the history of, 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 of Black people. And, and it teaches us something about self-care. It teaches us something about how it has been possible for all of these centuries, not only for Black people to survive, but for the impulse toward freedom to survive, which is as strong today as it was uh, during the era of slavery. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, 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 I when I feel down and when I feel as if nothing is changing and we're fighting the same battle over and over again, um, you know, I, um, I'll put on some Nina Simone and that completely changes my mind. <laughs> you know, I'll put on Coltrane or I'll, you know, listen to music. And I think that has to become a practice uh, that is incorporated in our um, in our efforts to create a, a major thrust in the direction of freedom. And Dr. Pickens reminds me that you have inspired music as well, and that you have several pieces out there um, that have been named for you. I cannot thank you enough, and I cannot thank you enough for reminding us of Black joy um, as part of and central to Black excellence, uh, freedom and liberation. and. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, being in your proximity, um, and please know that, that we carry you with us as we do this work um, and appreciate everything that you continue to do um, across time and, and space, and your brilliance has not dulled in any way. Um, I want to give a, a special thanks to the MLK Committee um, and, of course, to Dr. Pickens. Uh, thank you to Joshua Redd for the introduction. And again, a deep and profound um, and salient thank you to you, Dr. Davis. And let's let's also um, remember that uh, you know Dr. King uh, pointed out that uh, uh, that justice is indivisible. Yeah. And that um, you know all of these struggles are connected. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>